As IT leaders, you often spend most of your time doing what other people ask you to do, right? You're, you're maintaining environments, you're making sure that problems are solved. And a lot of times that turns into a very one-way relationship that doesn't allow you as the IT leader to have a vision and get things done that you want to make sure get done for the organization. You're basically spending most of your time doing what others ask you to do. This is a story really that illustrates how do you create those reciprocal relationships where I give and you give and I give and you give with people who are lateral to you across the organization and people who are above you in the organization. Because one of the challenges for an IT leader is that usually the people that you report to don't really know much about what you do, right? And that is a challenge. Uh, because your, your whole department is a black box there. And so having the types of relationships where you can really reciprocate and actually tell your bosses no in a way that allows them to accept that and then work with you to find out what the right answer is for what they're trying to accomplish is extremely important and the same thing across the organization. So in 2011, I took over as the CTO. Uh, for Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. I had gone from a very small district where I had two employees to this very large district where I suddenly had 22 employees, which we grew to 42 over six years. I found that it was the same job title as what I had at the small school district, but it was a completely different job, <laughs> completely different. Suddenly I wasn't doing any technical work anymore. I had people that did all that stuff and they wanted me to stay out of it as much as I could. <laughs> And then, and for the reason, because they were more expert than I was. I was a jack of all trades, taking care of a small environment. And here I am coming into a large environment. But one of the things that I found out pretty quickly was that the principals of schools can be a pretty rowdy little group. We had 30 of them. And what I found out as I worked with my IT folks was that they had a penchant of going out and using credit cards um, that would bypass the purchase order system of our school district and buying all kinds of equipment from Best Buy and then bringing it into our environment. They would even buy Geek Squad service to install it so that they didn't have to talk to us. Um, and, and it was like, I think we have a relationship problem here, right, as I came in, um, if principals are doing this. And, and so what would end up happening, of course, is they would try to install these really, really low-end home version types of devices. They wouldn't work properly or join properly on our network. And then they would have to call us and we'd come on saying, go, oh, what the heck is going on here, right? Why did you buy these things? What are you doing? And so it really created a sort of an adversarial atmosphere. And I was new, so I'm figuring this out as I go along. This was my first big challenge was to figure out how to fix that relationship laterally with people who I don't have, you know, authority over. I'm at the district office and their principals, kings and queens of their own domains at these schools. And, and so what I started doing was really looking into what are my options? How do I deal with this? And I realized right off the bat, because I had a conversation with my boss, who was the CBO, that it wasn't going to be an easy fix. My first thought was, I'll go to the CBO and I'll say, hey, can we get it so that all purchases, including credit card purchases, are routed through my department if they're tagged with technology? Um, so that I have the ability to say yes or no to every order, even if it's a credit card purchase. And the CBO very wisely said, we could do that. But I would encourage you not to try to do that. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, because what you may not realize is that individually, each of the principles is not necessarily very powerful. But they are the most powerful political force in the organization if they band together and more than 50% of them agree on something. She said, I guarantee you that if you do this, more than 50% of the principals will agree that you suck. 
<laughs> and you don't want that. And I was like, yeah, you're right, I probably don't want that. And so I believed her, and so I had to take another out avenue. So the first thing that I did was to really work on my vision. Now, I was fortunate. And I think this is, the, honestly, I'm going to spend the most time on this because this, is, to me, is the key. And as I work with other IT directors and CTOs, what I often find is this piece is the piece that's missing. When people are having trouble from a leadership perspective <coughs> in the IT environment, they often either don't have a vision at all or they're adopting the vision of their organization and then putting it on the back burner and not memorizing it and not ever mentioning it. Right? They're like, well, our vision is the vision of the organization. What I found is that in the entire IT department, it's important that you have a vision that really resonates with your department. And then that needs to slipstream into the bigger vision of the organization. So they can't be opposed to each other, but they do have to sort of rhyme, right? And make sense together, but really resonate with the employees. Now, the other thing that they need to resonate with is everybody else in the organization. So as I really created my vision, I didn't do it for everybody else originally. I, like I said, I was lucky in the sense that I came baked with a vision. I didn't like high school, personally. I thought it was a good I struggled through high school, not as much because I couldn't do the work, but because I wouldn't do the work. I wouldn't do the homework, I spent time doing what I wanted. And so I got straight C's through high school. And my mother always told me, you know, you could do better every week. You could get straight A's if you just apply yourself. But the reality was I wasn't going to apply myself unless the work was relevant to me. Unless I was interested in it. Unless I cared about it and was doing something real. And so when I got into schools, which is super ironic that I actually ended up working in schools, I, I fell into it. But I realized I have to have a vision for myself that keeps me going. And this is just for me. And so my first attempt at creating a vision was one that was really about creating more relevance in schools. I felt like technology was a great way to make school more relevant for students who are not necessarily interested in the typical academic process. If we could bring technology in, we might be able to bring the outside world to a certain degree in to school and make it more relevant. And that's why I was a big fan of one-to-one -one environments and giving students that kind of access. And so I had this vision going in, but all I had to do was sort of bolt to it the types of things that I knew would resonate not only with my employees, but also across the organization, the educational organization. Again, I was lucky because I found that as I shared my vision for what I was trying to accomplish with my employees, about 98% of my IT employees had the same types of experiences in high school. And so it was an easy sell, not a problem. But I did need to work on it a little bit for my relationship with the principals. And I knew that I was going to need to find some way to have a vision that when I communicated it to them, that they were gonna be nodding their heads and going, yeah, I want that too. Right? And that was going to be extremely important. The one thing that I want to make sure that people understand is that first and foremost, when you develop a vision, it has to be yours. Right? And you have to be willing to sacrifice for it. The secret to leadership, in my opinion, is simply that. You create what I would call a separate entity of a vision. It is not your vision, it's this thing that sits out here. And it's a separate entity like a corporation that you would create. And when you create that vision with a group of people, then you can point to the vision and blame the vision for, for having to sacrifice, right? I don't have to go around to my employees and try to tell them, do what I say I want you to do. I can ask them the question, do you believe in this vision? that we both are working towards? And if the answer is yes, then I can ask the question, is the thing that you're doing right now look like something that's going to move us forward towards that vision? And if the answer is no, then it's pretty easy to get them to be accountable to the vision and say, yeah, I'll change my behavior to make sure that we're moving towards the vision. And then it's not a me asking them to do something, 
It's really me just pointing towards the vision and saying, are we all going for that? Does what we're doing look like that? And that makes it much, much easier. So the next thing that I did in my problem with the principles was I decided to meet them where they are. It was kind of an aggressive move because apparently I found out that no other CTO in the district had ever actually gone to the schools and met every principal before, ever. So just the simple fact of going and doing it actually made a pretty huge statement across the district. The fact that I had my assistant set up a meeting and I did that 30 principals in 30 work days and I went to their school sites and met them on their turf really signaled that I cared about their environment. I didn't just want what I wanted, but I really wanted to understand what they wanted. The next step was ask them about their vision. So when I finally did get in front of each one of them, I had the same script that I was following. And the first thing to ask them about was, tell me what you want this school to look like that's different than it is now in three years. And then I'd write copious notes about everything that they said. <coughs> I wanted to make sure that I got a sense of what their challenges were. Because usually when somebody says, this is what I want, but is not happening yet, the challenges are kind of embedded, right? And so, if I could reveal their challenges in listening to what their vision was, then I could get a really good sense of what comes next. But also, there were some people, some of these principals that I'd seen them early on with some weird, what to me was some weird behaviors. They were doing some things that didn't make any sense to me. But when I got in front of them and asked them what they were aiming at with their school, what they were trying to accomplish, some of the things that they were doing that I didn't understand all of a sudden started to make sense when I understood their vision. And so as I'm asking about their vision, I'm revealing what are their challenges, getting a better understanding of why do they behave the way that they behave. So at this point, it was important to make the connection between two visions. The entire time that I'm listening and writing, I'm trying to understand where are the hooks into their vision that they're going to need for me to help solve? What are the problems they need me to help solve in order for them to get to the vision? And what are the things that I need from them in order to get to the vision I'm wanting to get to? So really, the idea is to understand what their hopes are and what their challenges are and start at this point making connections between those things and your capabilities as an IT organization. What are the solutions that you can bring to get them to their vision? So then at this point, only after I have listened to their vision and made connections in my mind between their vision and mine, at that moment is when I deliver my vision. And what I did was to really embed as much as I could the challenges that they face and the vision that they have into my delivery of their vision. Now this isn't easy unless you really, really have your vision pitched down. So you have to practice, right? You have to, you have to really understand how to say what your vision is in a minute or two. And then if you've got that down, what your purpose is, it's a little bit easier to on the fly take somebody else's challenges and vision and integrate that into yours in such a way that it looks like you just created one vision that you both believe in. And that's what I did. So I would embed their vision. I would sell my vision like crazy to them. It was about passion, about what I was trying to do as a human being in my life. The goal was at the end of that pitch to them about my vision, I want to see them nodding. I want to see them visibly agreeing, yes, I want that vision too. So it's not just about selling your vision, it's about really integrating that vision with theirs so that you can get agreement, visible agreement. And at that point, if I've got a principal nodding their head going, yes, I would like that. And I'll give you a sense of what it was, really. I would give them that, hey, I want schools to be as real as possible for students because I think we're missing it there. I think we lose a lot of kids along the way 
because they're just not interested. And I was that kid that put my hand up in the back of the class and said, how are we gonna use this in the real world? And I said it just like that. It wasn't very nice, I'm sure. And the teachers would get a little bit irritated with me. <coughs> um, and most of the time they would say, well, you need to learn this so that you can be successful in college. And then I would go, what if I don't want to pay to do more of this? What if I don't want to go to college? I'm talking about the real world, not the college world, the real world. And I said it with a lot of attitude, and I really ticked off a lot of my teachers when I was in school. But that was that was my attitude, and I, and I kind of brought that across to the principals. And I said, I really think it's important. We've got a large amount of students we lose along the way. And I want to make their education as real world and impactful as possible. If we do that, I think they'll do better, don't you think? And he says, she says, yes, I do think that. Okay, well, in real world technology environments, the speed and the quality of IT service is much better than it is on average in schools. How do you like the speed of your IT service today? And every single one of the principals told me, I don't like it, you guys are very too slow. All right, give me a worst case scenario. We got help desk tickets that were sitting in, in the help desk queue that have not been solved, that were supposed to be priority for two months. I mean, that's not acceptable by any standard, right? So, so I said, what if we got to the place where the speed of IT service at your school was so good that instruction never ever got interrupted because of the tech problem. Would you be for that? I never got enough for that question, right? I said, well, that's my goal. That's my vision for your school. Do you want that? The answer is yes, I want that speed. Do you want quality of service so that the interactions of my folks with your folks are positive interactions and people come away feeling more empowered to use the technology? Absolutely yes. Okay, good, we're getting that agreement. At this point in the conversation, I would start making promises. And the goal was to make sure that I was giving more than I was taking, at least in this first interaction. <laughs> right, ultimately I want the, the goal to be a, re a reciprocal relationship where we're giving and taking fairly equally, cool, right? But to start this out from a leadership perspective, you have to be prepared and willing to give more than you take in order to win your heart. And so I would give more than I take and I would make myself accountable to them. So I would give them the structure by which they could call me all out if I wasn't doing what I said I would do. The accountability piece is challenging. As I've coached IT leaders, what I find more often than not that this is the place where they balk the most. And the reason I think is because most IT leaders honestly don't live in a world full of accountability for themselves because the people above them don't know enough about their job to honestly keep them accountable. And the people in their department, well, it's hard for them to keep you accountable because you're their boss, right? But interestingly enough, when it comes to leadership, great leaders I find over and over again voluntarily make themselves accountable to other people, right? So it's an interesting, weird thing because most of the people that I work with say it's good that I don't have that much accountability. It gives me the freedom to do the things that I know need to be done. And I'm like, yeah, but it also creates a space when you don't have accountability to slough off sometimes and not do the things that you should do. And who's gonna call you? Nobody in the organization is really prepared to do that. And unless you create a system of accountability for yourself and then invite people to come to you accountable. Right? So that's really what this is about. Making promises that further both the department and the uh, organization that you're working with, the personal lateral person, 
that you're working with forward at the same time and then inviting them to keep you accountable. Now the good news is, as a leader, you get to define what that accountability looks like. So leadership is about two things, inspiration and accountability. And sometimes those things feel diametrically opposed, right? It's, it's like, it's not very inspiring to have to keep people accountable, right? Nobody, nobody likes having that conversation. Um, but, but it's not about being the accountability cop as a leader. It's about creating an environment within which there's enough trust that people will willingly make themselves accountable to the vision. So when you can create a vision as a, as a separate entity from yourself, that becomes a whole lot easier than to say, hey, everybody, let's make ourselves accountable to that vision, right? And I'm the leader, so I'm gonna go ahead and lead out and I'll be the first to make myself accountable to you guys to make sure I'm doing the things that I said I was gonna do when it comes to this vision. And when you lead out that way, it encourages everybody around you to go, oh, okay, that's the right answer. I'll do that too, okay? So making yourself accountable doesn't have to be a scary thing. In fact, it's incredibly, incredibly empowering. Especially when you go to somebody who's lateral or anybody who doesn't have authority in structure. When you go to somebody who's lateral or somebody who works in your department and you make yourself accountable to them, that is incredibly inspiring to them. And they will respect you so much more for doing Finally, I've done all of this stuff in my conversation with the principal to get to the ask. And the ask was simply this. Understanding all of the things that we've talked about, about vision and where we want this school to be, and where I would like our department and our service to be, and we've agreed that we want all of those things. Yes, yes, absolutely. I've also promised you three things that I will do to move this vision forward. How I not? Yes, and I've made it so that you can keep me accountable to those promises. Have I done that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, then I have one ask for you. you open, open ears, and it's, in order for me to properly support you and make sure that our IT staff can do the kind of speed of service that we've talked about today, I need you to voluntarily give me control of the purchasing processes for tech. And once I got to that place, and we had gone through that entire conversation, did I get 100% of them to say yes? No. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't. I got about 60%, not bad, pretty good. And I thought, is that enough? If I got 60% of them to say yes, how do I move forward? I can't make everybody you know, if, I, if the CBO could kind of lay that out and said, you can't have control of this unless the principal is give it to you, then how am I gonna deal with that? So I laid out a plan and, and we figured out a way to make it so that some schools purchases got routed through us and the ones that said no, didn't. But one of the things that I told them once they said yes, that they would let me do that was I embedded another promise in the ask. Now I'm up to four promises for just one ask. But I embedded one more promise in the ask. I said, if you give me control of the purchasing process for technology, if I think it need, a purchase needs to be stopped or declined, before I do that, the first thing I will do is call you directly and ask you what it is that you're trying to accomplish in structure. And I will do everything I can do to figure out what the right answer is to help you get that done. I will never ever just say no. I will say, how can we do this? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So then I had to keep my promises, right? So in practice, what we did was we got those 60% of schools moved over to this new purchasing method, which went through me for, for approvals, all technology tag for purchases, and I had to keep my promises. I had a number of situations where I had to stop something because it just wasn't gonna work. 
And sometimes it was difficult to pick up the phone and go through the process and, and, and do what I promised that I would do, but I did. And as I did it with each one of those, what I found was that it not only grew the trust that I had with the individual that I went through that with and actually followed through on my promises with, but something really magical started happening. What was magical? They started telling other principals that I was a man of my word. The networking effect was way more powerful than I ever gave the credit for in an organization. I didn't need 100% of the principals because the 40 principals that said no started hearing from the other 60% of the principals who said, Tim's a man of his word, he's doing what he said he would do, and guess what? The support of my school has gone up exponentially since then. I didn't have to convince them after that. The people who originally said no, within about a year, one by one, they started rolling. They came to me and said, could you control my tech purchases? <laughs> and, give, and give my school site the support that you're making sure that other school sites are getting? And the answer was yes. I'm so happy you came and talked to me. <laughs> so you're not gonna win up all the first time around. You know, when you have these types of relationships, you're gonna get some people who just by doing the act, you'll have them just by the fact that you went over to their office and asked about the vision. Some of them are just gonna be with you right off the bat. Some of them are gonna be a lot more resistant. And that's just the way it goes. But the point is not to get 100%. The point is to get enough that then you can prove to the ones who engaged with you that you are a person <coughs> of your work. And once you make that proof, laterally across your organization, I guarantee you, you'll be the IT director that is being talked about in a positive way. And ultimately, what I found is the support that I got from the principals, the CBO was right. That as I got 60, 70, 80% of the principals to believe me that I meant what I said and when I said I wanted to help them get, the, get to their visions, that their power put me in a place in the organization of extreme influence with everybody, with the superintendent, with the assistant superintendents. People listen to what Tim Gorey said because 80% of the principals told everybody in the organization that they should listen to what Tim Gorey says. So it's a game of networking and it's a game of relationships and a game of making promises, inviting accountability, and then following through. Are you gonna do it every, right every time? No, I didn't. Like I made lots of mistakes, I dropped the ball multiple times, but when I dropped the ball, I had to go and, you know, like friendship relationships are, I had to go and admit that I dropped the ball and say, I'm going to do better, I promise, <laughs> you know, and try to repair that.